Okay, in this video I'm going to begin a series of tutorials on magnetostatics. This is video number one and I'm going to discuss the Lorentz force law. There are two sections previous to this which are relevant. The first section is vector calculus for electromagnetism. It should be pretty clear to you why this section is important. The next important section is that of electrostatics. Now, the reason our study of electrostatics is important for magnetostatics is that many of the techniques and procedures we used to discuss and analyze electrostatics are carried over and duplicated when we discuss magnetostatics. So if you know how to analyze electrostatics, then you know how to analyze magnetostatics. So the bottom line up front is as follows. Magnetism is caused by moving electric charges. I think it's important to note this and to take, a to take your time to actually appreciate its importance. I feel that a lot of people don't actually fully realize uh, the implications of this particular statement. So from your study of electrostatics, you'll know that a stationary electric charge produces an electric field. Now, I haven't said it in the past, but I'm sure it won't be any surprise to you to know that a moving electric charge also produces an electric field. The additional point to note here is that a moving electric charge also causes a magnetic field. So, a stationary electric charge just causes an electric field. However, a moving electric charge causes both an electric field and a magnetic field. And we call that the electromagnetic field. Remember, of course, that moving charges where you have a sufficient number of them or a sufficient frequency of oscillation constitute a current. So really, all magnetism comes down to currents, and that's what we will be discussing. So let's begin. Now, I have said in the past that I'm not a particularly good drawer, I'm not an artist by any stretch of the imagination, so the diagrams I've drawn in front of you might be a bit confusing to start, but I hope to explain them. At the top left of your screen, I've drawn, first of all, a stand. It's in purple. So we have the base of our stand, we have the vertical section, and then we have, of course, a horizontal section. The purpose of this stand is to suspend a coil of wire from the ground. So I've drawn a coil of wire in black. We've attached it to the top of the, to the, top of the stand here and here. The coil of wire then goes downwards, and excuse me, the wire itself goes downwards, and I've made a coil of wire at the bottom, but it is, of course, suspended above the ground. The coil of wire then, uh, it comes up as a single strand to the top of our stand and then to a battery with a switch. So the battery of course can be anywhere, but just for uh, aesthetic reasons I've drawn it above mainly because I suppose I can't draw it anywhere else. The next thing I've done is, I've what well, the next thing we can do is put a bar magnet at the same height as our, uh, as our coil of wire. Now I won't discuss the poles of the magnet. So this is the sort of experiment which you could perform at home. And if you did the experiment, you would find the following. When you switched on your battery by turning on the switch and having current flowing, you will see that there would be a deflection in your, in your co coil of wire, depending, of course, on, what, um, on, uh, on your magnetic field. But basically, let's say we have the coil of wire moving away from the, magnetic, uh, the magnet, which, of course, has a magnetic field. And once we switch off the current by, by opening up the switch, the coil of wire would fall back to its original position after a few oscillations. And you could repeat this and you'll find that every time you complete the circuit and you have current flowing, your coil of wire will deflect away from your magnetic field or, excuse me, deflect away from your magnet. So just note this for a moment. We seem to have currents and a magnetic field interacting and it, it seems to be causing movement. So let's discuss two more experiments you can perform at home. The first one is on the top right of your screen. Here we have a battery connected from either terminal through a wire. So I've drawn the wire as a, as a uh, I suppose, twisted or looped just for aesthetic reasons. So if you turn on your switch in this case, what you'll find is that your two straight segments of wire will repel. Note, of course, like I said, we do have two straight segments, one here and one here. So it seems that when you have straight segments of wire, the, uh, the wires themselves will repel. The important thing to note here is the direction of the current. So the current will be going 
to the right on the top uh, segment of wire, but it'll be going to the left in the bottom segment of wire. Let's just ignore on the right hand side for the moment. So it seems in this case that currents moving in the opposite direction are causing the uh, wires to repel. Now let's adjust this particular situation up here and put some sort of a loop in the wire on the right hand side. The important point to note here is well, at this time is that okay we have a straight segment here, a straight segment here, here and here. So we now have four straight segments. Let's analyze which direction the currents are flowing. We have current flowing this direction here, flowing this direction here, this direction here and this direction here. Note my arrows in purple. In this particular case we see that the two segments of wire will attract and in this section the two segments of wire will attract. Note of course the directions of the current flow. The result is as follows. Currents moving in the same direction cause an attractive force and currents moving in the opposite direction cause a repulsive force. What are we looking at, it he at here? Nothing but magnetism. The common theme of course is we have moving charges. Moving charges constitute a current. So currents cause magnetism. So let's move, let's move on. So stationary electric charges produce an electric field. I've discussed that. Moving electric charges cause both an electric field and a magnetic field. So if we were to look at the form of the electric field or the direction of the electric field, what would we see? So how do we detect it? We detect it, let's say, like using a, a Boy Scouts compass. And what we'll find is that the field actually encircles the wire. And this is, of course, in contrast to the field of an electric charge. Let's say here's our positive electric charge. We found that we had a diverging electric field away from a positive charge and a converging electric field towards a negative charge. So in this case, the magnetic field doesn't do that. Now immediately that suggests that we don't have magnetic charges or what we would call magnetic monopoles. But that's jumping ahead. So let's say we have a wire and I've drawn the wire in dark blue on the bottom left of your screen. And let's say the current is flowing upwards. Now how do we work out, uh, well to, ease, to, to find out where the magnetic field is going or its direction you, you would use a Boy Scout compass. But the quick way of doing it is as follows. You, with your right hand, you curl, your, excuse me, you put your thumb in the direction of the current and you curl your fingers into your palm. So just to say that once more, your thumb is pointing in the direction of the current and you have curled your fingers in towards your palm. The curling of your fingers indicates the curl of the electric field or the direction of the electric field. And it's illustrated at the bottom left of your screen. Clearly, of course, the curl of the magnetic field is non-zero. Why is that important? Well, because when we discussed electrostatics, we saw that the curl of the electrostatic field is in fact zero. The, the curl of the electromagnetic field is, is non-zero. Now, as I said a moment ago, it seems that the divergence of the magnetic field is zero. And that turns out to be the case. And we talk, we talk of that as either being an unnamed law or we sometimes call it Gauss's law for magnetism. The rule which I discussed there is called the right hand rule for obvious reasons and it's very important. So just to say it once more time, you point your thumb in the direction of the current, you curl your fingers and then the direction of the curl of your fingers indicate the direction of your magnetic field. So let's say in this case at the bottom left I reverse my current and I have it going this way. That means I would have to point my thumb downwards and my fingers would curl in the opposite direction and we would have a magnetic field doing something like this if the magnetic field direction would swap. Now let's move to the top right of your screen. So we said a moment ago that currents moving in the same direction they attract and currents moving in the opposite direction repel. So this is interesting. Let's say for example we have two wires, two parallel wires and they're straight. And I've drawn those in purple and we have currents 1 and 2. I1, I sub 1 and I sub 2. So we know that they attract. So they, on the first wire, here on the left hand side, there is a force on that wire, bringing it towards the, the, other, uh, the other current. 
and vice versa we also have a current f sub 2. So what else do we have? Well of course we can now write in or draw the magnetic field and we know the magnetic field curls around the wire itself we know the direction of the magnetic field through the right hand rule and I've drawn the direction in. The question I pose to you is how do we account for the directions? How do we how, what mathematical formula can we possibly use which will account for the direction of the magnetic field, the current, and the force applied onto each one of these, uh, these line segments of current? Well, the answer to that is a bit more complicated than you might think. The answer requires a law called the law of BON Savar, and I will discuss that at a, in a future video. So now let's discuss electric for, excuse me, magnetic force. In order to describe magnetic forces, we need what's called the Lorentz force law. So force is, of course, a vector, and we calculate it as follows. For a magnetic field, we have the charge, uh, which is being affected by our, our magnetic field, and we have that outside the velocity of the charge with the cross product with the magnetic field. If we have an electric field, then we have F is equal to Q outside of E plus V cross B. But let's say we don't have an electric field, we're just talking about magnetostatics. That means the magnetic force, F sub M, is going to be charge Q outside of V cross B. And the Q we're talking about here is the charge which is inside the magnetic field. Now an important result of this particular uh, force law is that magnetic forces do no work. And I will illustrate that in a moment. Now you might ask yourself, how do I go about proving the Lorentz force law? And the answer is that, as far as I'm aware, you can't, and it's the result of an experiment. So lots of experiments were performed, and it turned out that this pretty straightforward and simple mathematical formula was able to account for the directions. So magnetic forces do no work. We know, of course, that work is equal to the line integral of f dot dl, or the path integral. So I'm going to plug in the magnetic force or the Lorentz force law in terms of f down here, or for f down here. So if q outside of the line integral of v cross b dot dl, dl of course is the is the line we're integrating across. We know that distance is speed by time or velocity times time, so we have dl is v uh, v times dt. So really what we're looking at is the following integral. We have q outside of the integral of v cross b dotted with, with v dt. Now it's important to look at the directions here. v cross b is going to be perpendicular to both v and b. That is the, de the definition of the cross product. So if we can imagine that we have a plane, this is the plane of v and b, then the cross product is going to be perpendicular to the plane of v and b. So v cross b is perpendicular to v. That means that v cross b dot v is going to be equal to zero because the dot product requires us to have a cosine and we're going to get a zero. The result is the work done and a charge moving in a magnetic field is zero. The conclusion is as follows. Magnetic forces may alter a particle's direction but they cannot alter a particle's speed. And this is very important. So sometimes you will come up with a situation come across a situation that seems to be implying that magnetic forces are doing work. However, it will usually take some very uh, subtle arguments and very clever thinking to show in fact that it is not magnetic forces doing the work. Just before I continue, I'd like to discuss this, uh, this cross product, how we compute the cross product. So the way I compute the cross product is not using what's known as the right hand rule. I prefer to use the left hand rule. So as far as I'm concerned, I use two, two rules. Excuse me, that's the R. So we have the right-hand rule and the left-hand rule. So I use the right-hand rule to work out the direction of the magnetic field. I point my thumb in the direction of the current, I curl my fingers, and the, my, my fingers curl in the direction of the magnetic field. That's the right-hand rule. The left-hand rule allows me to compute a cross product. Let's say I want to calculate V cross B. And I this is just personally the one I use. So let's say we have a situation where V is in this direction like this and B is in this direction. How would I compute the left hand rule and calculate the direction of the cross product V cross B? Well what I do is I first of all close my 
fist, my left, my, the, my left fist. I extend my index finger. So I put my index finger in the direction of the first part of the cross product, in this case V. So that this, let's say this is my index finger here. Then what I do is I extend my thumb. So it makes a sort of L shape. And then I turn, I rotate my, my wrist so that the thumb is now pointing in the direction of the other component of the cross product, in this case B. But of course my index finger is still pointing in the direction of the first component V. Then what I do is I extend my middle finger and I extend my middle finger so that it is perpendicular to my palm. So it's perpendicular to both the your index finger and it is perpendicular to your thumb. So in this particular case it is going to be pointing in this direction here downwards. And this is going to be the direction of V cross B. So let's say it's going to be minus I hat. Let's say if I say I hat is we have Excuse me, let's say my x-axis points this way. So this is going to be negative in the x direction. Now sometimes you might have to move your hand in odd ways to line up your fingers accordingly, but that's the way I do it. And I call that the left hand rule. And sometimes people will say, use the right hand rule to work out the cross product. There is a similar but different right hand rule for working out the cross product. So now that I've done that, I'd like to conclude. Moving charges, which are currents, constitute the source of a magnetic field. Currents moving in the same direction attract. Currents moving in the opposite direction repel. The Lorentz force law accounts for this particular direction, and we say it's Q outside of the cross product of the velocity of your charge and the magnetic field. We can also, of course, include the electric, for the electric field, but for the moment, we'll leave that out. And magnetic forces do no work. Thanks for watching. Please pass it on to your friends, subscribe to my channel and you might also give me a comment in the comment box below.